Welcome. It is Neurodiversity Celebration Week, a week where we celebrate the diversity of humankind. My name is Nat. Today we are doing a deep dive into the history of Asperger's condition. Big disclaimer, on my YouTube channel, I'm not saying I get loads of trolls, but my number one troll is the fact that I do not pronounce As Asperger's correctly. Today we are going to be looking at what is the actual history? Not of the individual. We've already done the history of um, Hans Asperger. We're going to be looking at about the diagnosis. It was only like a diagnosis for a really short amount of time in history. Yet it has had a gigantic impact in our understanding of autism, the general public's enthusiasm around it. We're also going to be looking at the ramifications of it. How, what kind of impact, both positive and negative, has it left on us in a day-to-day -day environment? Today, we are predominantly focusing on autism and the subsets that were previously a part of it. Here's a picture of me. Again, I was diagnosed with high functioning autism, which some people would say is interchangeable with Asperger's. Is it? Is it not? You know, there are different nuances and both of them are redundant. Here's our team. You got myself today, you got April, and you've also got our American interns, Daniela and Blake. Again, thanks for having you both. And we are a neurodivergent team, specialists, because we live it every day, but also because we work with people every day. And also, merely academic professionals. I only have two weeks left of my master's. Every week we deliver webinars, and the last one was on neurodivergent jobs. Looking at what type of jobs are suitable for ND individuals. Do you know what? It wasn't as simple as... IT. It was more looking at the type of organizations, which ones are inclusive, how do you find if they're inclusive, looking at the different programs and systems that have been put in place. I think ultimately we came to the conclusion, organizations are not inclusive, managers are inclusive. People do not leave companies, they leave managers. The history of Asperger's syndrome. It's an interesting one. It's a really long history, but the history of the actual syndrome is really short and like I said we have previously done ones on the history of Hans Asperger who was a very interesting fella but we haven't often done it on the syndrome which is mainly by this woman here Lorna Wing. Let's go let's do some history let's go right back. We go back to the early 20th century autistic was coined but yeah autistic not autism is the OG word and this was created by Eugene. He founded autistic he didn't found autism that's a really important distinction because his idea of autistic wasn't autistic it was schizophrenia it was essentially schizophrenia in children that's where it originally came from now Kana and Asperger who we will talk about later they adopted this term they're like you know what I like that term I'm going to use that term but it's not going to mean the exact same thing yeah founder of the term not founder of the condition important to know. Now here's a quick one just to get a feel of the room. Terminology is more important than ever. What term do you personally agree with or prefer? Do a little pin on whichever one you prefer. Living with autism, suffering from autism, on the autism spectrum, a person with autism, autistic person. Most people currently, particularly those with autism, will say autistic. And that's really interesting because the very first term to ever speak about autism was autistic. Even though the what it means has changed dramatically, it's interesting that we've come full circle and we've started exactly what we're finishing, or at least for now, where we have started. But yeah, interesting. How was autistic thinking described? Now, in this book, what, how was it described originally? I've given the answer a little bit already. We got, was it escape into fantasy due to unmet wishes? Was it neurodevelopmental conditions with unique information processing? Or was it result of poor parenting disorders and environmental factors? Well, Alex says, lives with autism because you can live your life with it. Do you know what, Alex? It really is each to their own on this. There isn't right nor wrong. This is interesting coming in. It is actually the first one. Autistic thinking was, remember, it was schizophrenia in children. Before that, it was escape into fantasy due to unmet wishes. They thought that the fact that maybe you weren't able to do something that kind of led on to a type of schizophrenia. There was a very strong relationship at that time to parenting or aka the refrigerator mother theory. 
that kind of came on a little bit later. While people suspected it, we're, a, we're jumping the gun a little bit. Infant wishes. That is more when we are talking about the autistic syndrome or along the time. When we are just talking about generic autistic thinking, it could have been described a little bit more broadly. An ND condition where you need info processing, that is how we currently see it. That is how we see it now and how we used to see it. Very different. Okay, nicely moving on. How is autism actually characterized today? Nowadays, this isn't about not meeting your dreams come true. No, it's not like that. Nowadays, we just call it ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. It goes into two sections, which we call the dyad of impairments. It's social communication mixed with repetitive behavior and sensory sensitivities. Now, if any of you like, I swear you speak about the triad of impairments. Yeah, we used to use a triad of impairments, which was social communication, repetitive behavior, and verbal communication. But essentially, they just put all the communications in one category and kind of just simplified it down to a dyad rather than a triad. Hopefully that follows. Anyway, we're not here to discuss the present. We're here to discuss the past. Let's keep going back. 1943, our main man, Kanna, describes autism. Kanna was an American citizen by the time he died. Kanna was arguably the OG when it comes to describing what we know today as autism. He described it predominantly as extreme self-isolation and obsessive insistence on sameness, a.k.a. repetition. It hasn't really changed that much in all these years. We've just changed the wording a little bit. Now, autism is a direct translation of alone, people who like to be isolated. We know that is way simplifying things. But you've got to appreciate this was a while ago now. Their understandings have changed. Now, while this guy was in America... Funnily enough, there was another person on the other side of the pond called Hans Asperger who was doing the exact same work, but also originally from Austria. Karna discovered or founded fatal autism schizophrenia in children. This was the very beginning. Already newspaper articles were hitting the headlines. What was grandma even saying in the first place? Breastfeeding and loving care for babies held as a problem of juvenile delinquents. Essentially, this was ground zero when talking about the refrigerator mother theory. If you didn't love your kid enough, or maybe you loved your kid too much, then your kid was going to get autism. This time, they didn't call it autism. They just called it being a naughty child. This is where they tied it into this first definition. Connor would go on to develop this much further and expand upon this autism schizophrenia, but this was his starting point. Hans Asperger, 1944, only one year after Craner, identifies Asperger's syndrome. The really important thing to remember here is he identifies it, he doesn't coin it. He never calls it after himself. We probably wouldn't have had a clue what you're on about. Now, he was an Austrian. And he published Observation of Children with High Intelligence and Unique Challenges. This was quite different from Craner. While one was focusing on the behavioral side, the other one was focusing more on the intelligence side. But they were happening at the same time. Again, coincidence or not. Oh, April says, both my brother and I were diagnosed as ASD in November 1991. Again, a great year. While I was officially diagnosed with ASD, my brother was either diagnosed with ASD or Canners due to his non-verbal communication. Yes, Canners autism is sometimes called classic autism, and that more refers to those who struggle with non-verbal communication, may struggle with behavior aspects, things along those lines, where Asperger's was much more about those who have unique social challenges. Okay, we've got the video. I breastfed my children. My children are also autistic. I would never have even thought that anyone would have once linked the two interesting. Yet people did link ridiculous now. With all this past, you'll notice that even though we are talking nearly 100 years, you will see that some of these stigmas are still connected or they do ripple through time. It takes a few moments to write an article shaming someone, but it takes nearly a lifetime to be able to remove it from public consciousness altogether. Uh, okay, Alex says, I have never been officially diagnosed, but in my early LSA statements at school, it was referred to, and I have always displayed many, but not all, maintenance grants. It's interesting because, again, if you didn't meet all the criterias, this is the reason why Asperger's syndrome was originally created, in order to catch people who would normally fall through the net, 
of a classic autistic syndrome. But he also completely revolutionized how we see autism today. He wasn't an official Nazi, but he was complicit with the Nazi regime. He very well may have disagreed with it. He never outrightly spoke against it. History is complicated, but why do we get rid of Asperger's syndrome? Oh, it's because he was a Nazi. Isn't true. We got rid of it for different reasons. Moving nicely on. Key messages in... Does anyone want to help read this? By... Ost it's in German. We don't even know what it's on about. This is a really important thing. Though his work has been published for a very long time, it wasn't until... I think we'll come back to... I think like 1990 when they like first actually found this information and translated it. Maybe Kana copyrighted or plagiarized him because he translated it, or maybe it's just one of those coincidences. I guess we're not going to really know. It's not the nicest way of talking about autism, let's be real. This is when both of our autism experts were in their own area creating distinctions between schizophrenia and autism. They're like, you know what, wait a sec, this doesn't really look like schizophrenia. For one, schizophrenia comes after birth. It's something that develops. It's also something which normally gets worse. Whereas this autistic characteristic is something which you are born with and it does improve with coping strategies and through life events. Already we're like, you know what? This isn't schizophrenia. Here are just some of the things when we're looking at attention, cognition, language, memory, effective. These are all things that were affected from day one. From the second you were born, this is why we were, you know what? We aren't speaking about what we thought we were speaking about. Both individuals realize this at the same time. Suspicious. On here, I want you to put a pin on what you consider a autistic symptom. Out of here, have a little look and put them wherever you like. Obviously, there's going to be a few overlaps here. And I just want to see if many people are picking autism or are they picking schizophrenia? Okay, nice. We've got special interest, yes, yeah, social difficulties, repetitive behavior and routines. Anyone else? Now, most people have put it on this light blue side. If you put it on this light blue side, yeah, absolutely. That is a classic autism characteristic. If, however, you put it in this kind of teal side, these are classic schizophrenia characteristics. But in the middle, these are characteristics which are seen in both. This is where people got a little bit confused. When you see autism from a much wider perspective, you realize that it does have distinct differences. If you are focusing on certain areas, maybe you can see why there was some kind of overlap or some confusion. Moving on to the 80s. Oh, the OG Lorna Wing proposes autism syndrome. She's, yeah, why haven't we thought about this before? I've just found this amazing paperwork and it describes everything already. Why hasn't this guy as never had credit? We should probably name it after him. But Wings broadened Asperger's observations, highlighting social isolation and unique cognitive abilities. That is a real key thing here. She broadens it. It's not a direct copy and paste. Without him, I wouldn't have been able to expand my research. Her research is far more progressive than the original 1940s. Now, yes, I was right. Woohoo, go with memory. 1991 is when they actually finally translated it. Remember, 1991, that's a considerable amount of time. During the war and everything going on, it wasn't people's priorities. They dug it out, they translated it, and it was here. This is what we originally meant when we spoke about Asperger's. And this was translated from the original paper. It says, in what follows, I will describe a particularly interesting and highly recognizable type of child. The child I will present all have in common a fundamental disturbance, which manifests itself in their physical appearance, expressive functions, yeah. and indeed their whole behavior. The disturbance results in severe and characteristic difficulties in social interaction. In many cases, the social problems are profound that they are overshadowing something else. Originally talking about comorbidity in some ways. In some cases, however, the problems are compensated by a high level of original thought and experiences. Now, this is interesting because though we always like, boo, related to Nazis, bad person, 
his original work and research on autism was very progressive. It wasn't talking about all deficits. It was talking about actually there are a lot of pros and strengths. Hans Asperger was potentially the original spiky profile creator. Before we go all, I love him. Hans, my man. He only thought that about people who were high functioning. If you were low functioning, he didn't think favorably upon you. It was those individuals that potentially he may have sent to at their death. Keep that in mind. This can often lead to exceptional achievements in later life. Again, talking about autism, adults, which has not been a thing. It was a thing. We just didn't find his research until later. With the types of personality disorders presented here, we can demonstrate the truth of the claim that exceptional humans must have given exceptional educational treatments. Different education for different people. Again, really progressive treatments which take account of their special difficulties. Further, we can show that despite abnormal human beings can fulfill their social role within community, especially if they find understanding, love and guidance. This sounds really nice and you would have no idea it was created by someone who was working under the Nazi regime. I guess it shows you that history is complicated. There are many reasons for describing in detail this type of abnormally developing child. Not the least of them is that these children raise questions of central importance of psychology and education. Apologies that I butchered that when reading, dyslexic and all, but it shows you that autism or classic was very, very niche. There was many people who weren't being categorized with any need of support, but would gain support. Given the right adjustments, reasonable adjustments and support and environments, people can achieve in life. We have been saying this since 1940. I bet a lot of you may have not realized that. After 1940, 1950s, 1960s is when we started to condemn it and blame parents for being terrible parents or breastfeeding the kids, etc. Moving into 1994, Lorna Wing has been picking up some steam. People are starting to agree with this woman. The Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders and Asperger's Syndrome was officially recognized. We already had autistic disorders before, but now we have a distinct one, Asperger's. And this was distinct, which is a really important thing. So 1994, it didn't take that long. 19 it was coined, 1994 included. In the late 20th to early 21st century, the diagnostic criteria is evol evolving. You've got uh, Gilberg, 2002, et al, 1989. We've also got the, the ICD-10 and DSM. We've got all different people saying, you know what, this is autism, this is autism, this is autism. They agreed on a few things like impaired social functioning, but some of them had other reasons. The ones that won was no delay in language acquisition, no delay in cognitive development. That's Asperger's. Social isolation and motor clumsiness. Those ones did not win in the long run. Now, if you're not sure, the ICD is the World Health Organization, which the UK uses and most of Europe. The DSM is the American version, but is also used very internationally as well. Ah, oh, Avril says, I thought Asperger's was coined in 1981. It wasn't published then. I think that's a difference. While it was founded, it wasn't published. I think published is when you can officially say something is coined. Otherwise, there's plenty of words I've officially coined, but because I didn't get it published, no one appreciates. As we're redeveloping these, what it actually means to be autistic, we redeveloped it even further. And we realize that there is a lot of overlap and it's actually really difficult to say you have one and you have the other because people are nuanced. We are going to have to do some developing. That is when we started creating a new criteria and a new name was needed. We had autistic disorder, aka classic autism. We had Asperger's syndrome, those who basically could go undercover and no one would even know they had autism. We had Invasive development disorder, which was another form of autism. All of these labels, eh, not that useful. Let's blur it all into one big blob, which means more people can get support. There's less contradictions. It's more accurate. And there's also more wiggle room to support a wider amount of individuals. All in all, it was a good thing. Really, not that long ago, 2013. Hence why people are still talking about it. Here is another diagram. Back in the day, we had the overarching umbrella of pervasive development disorders, and this include things like Rett's, childhood de disingenuate disorder. We had the autism spectrum disorders, which we had classic autism, Asperger's, 
and not otherwise specified. Ugh, there was too many categories. What happens if you were in here, slip through the net, or here, slip through the net? What they did, they thought, you know what? Let's scrap pervasive development disorders altogether. Autism spectrum disorders, let's call it autism spectrum disorder. And we combine it into one. There is only one condition that you'll get diagnosed with. One to rule them all. Rett syndrome is still a condition, but we realized that actually it's not really like autism at all. We just moved it into another category. The time when 1990, when Asperger's syndrome was originally introduced, so 2013, when it was kicked out and told to find a new home, that really isn't a long amount of time. But yet we are still talking about the syndrome in 2024. The new autism, the new and improved ASD in the DSM-5, while it doesn't have distinct subsets, it can be categorized in terms of levels. You've got level one autism. This might be struggling to live independently. Level two, a little bit more able, need a little bit less support. And then three is needing a lot of support. This might seem unfamiliar to a lot of you because in the UK, we do not have levels. This is very much a DSM understanding of autism where the ICD-11, which is what we typically we do not. We just have autism spectrum disorder. We do not have levels. That's while there is a lot of overlap and they are essentially the same condition, there is just a little bit more explanation. Personally, I don't like the idea of level. It's not like I'm currently level one autism. If I work my ass off, maybe I can become level two. It doesn't work like that. Still though, interesting. And let me know your thoughts if you prefer this way of classifying autism or if it's better to keep it more general. Honestly, would love to know your thoughts and opinions. Here, I want you to rank the reasons why Asperger's syndrome is still in use. Why are we still using it? It's been redundant since 2013, yet it's still in common population. Now, this is quite interesting because this is a little diagram. And if any of you know what PUP is, essentially, this is where you do all your searching for all the articles. And if you do a quick search, just put like Asperger, you can see how many mentions or reports were done through each year. Starting off in the 70s, 90s, 1991 is when it was originally coined, right? And then from 1991 to 94, you see it's going up and up and up and up and up and up. 2007 was the absolute peak of Asperger's syndrome. Then we changed it. You can see it goes down. It's interesting that we see how, even though there has been a general trend of people using it less, it's still very much in circulation. Vicky says, my husband wasn't diagnosed until 2017, ASD, but still mentioned that he would previously have met uh, Asperger's diagnosis. I think a lot of people still resonate with it. We've got historical recognition. Let's not forget about history. We should definitely appreciate the good and the benefit that it was able to do give to autistic populations. Clinical familiarity. I genuinely do not know metric measurements. I only know imperial. We grow up with the language that the people before us used, hence maybe that is just more familiar to most. Personal preference, maybe autism feels a little bit too wide for most and Asperger's pinpoints a bit more on how they personally feel. The term Aspie has become more and more popular over the years, referring to essentially rather than an autistic person, you'd have an Aspie. Chris Rock, the comedian, uses Asperger's to describe him as well. It'd be interesting to know when Rock was diagnosed. We're looking beyond 2013. Where are we currently now? We've got the merger into one diagnosis to rule them all has sparked a lot of discussion about classification. Do we even need classification? Is the current diagnosis fit for purpose? If we were to create the new DSM-6, what would it look like then? Some people think that maybe we'll start calling it ASC, autism spectrum condition because it's far more inclusive and has less negative connotations where medical professionals may still, for instance, use ASD. This is the official term. Both of them are autism. We've got social communication disorder. This is saying there's different conditions and essentially this is like autism light. Those who have autism like characteristics, but not quite autistic, where do they fit in? Some people are saying, actually, that condition is still way more useful than just lumping everyone with ASD. If you think about it, some, if you say I've got autism, 
someone may be completely nonverbal, struggle with independent living, and then you have someone who might be a CEO of a massive company. It seems weird to give both type of cognitive processing the same condition. I have been talking enthusiastically about a redundant term for a while now. Let's do a nice quiz to see if you are paying attention. Get your fingers out the ready because quiz time is upon us. We've got five questions in order to test your Asperger's knowledge. I know, I bet some of you are wishing you were paying attention now. First, describer of Asperger's syndrome. Who was it? Was it Leo Karner? Was it Eugene Bleuler? Was it Hans Asperger or was it Lorna Wing? Who was the first describer of the syndrome? Yes, that no one put Hans Asperger because he didn't describe it. That would be a little bit vain of him. Leo didn't do it because he was basically in competition with Hans, even though they probably maybe didn't know about each other. Eugene, he coined autistic. He didn't coin Asperger's. It was Lorna Wing who coined the term. She named it in admiration of the research that came before her, but she definitely developed what we understood it to be. All right, Asperger's syndrome in the DSM-5 question mark. What happened in the DSM-5? Where'd it go? Was it merged? Was it given precedence over autism? Did it remain a distinct diagnosis or was it removed from the manual? It was merged and that's a key thing. It wasn't removed. Asperger's is still a thing. It's just merged into a wider diagnosis. It's, we haven't lost that learning and understanding. We've just created it into a more all-encompassing diagnosis, which is arguably more beneficial. Because as we always speak about, a diagnosis isn't about giving you all the answers. It's about giving you a foundation to engage in a conversation. I think ASD does that far more effectively than say individual conditions, which can be a bit narrowing. What distinguished Asperger's syndrome from high functioning autism? Was it delayed language development, more stereotyped behavior, superior verbal performance and motor skills, or greater desire for friendship? Most of you got that right, which is great. Superior verbal performance and motor skills. That was the distinction because I had actually I think it was Asperger's, yeah, had most schools because I'm also diagnosed with dyspraxia. Interesting. This kind of distinction, by the way, has always been a little bit unofficial because high-functioning autism has never been officially classified as a type of autism in any of the diagnostic manuals that I'm aware of. Reasons for Asperger's syndrome controversy? The answer was contradictory definitions and criteria. It was true. There was a lot of contradictions. The definition was messy. It needed a little bit of consolidating, a little bit of pruning to get it fit for purpose. Now, there was absolutely enough research around Asperger's to say it was real. It just wasn't flexible enough to make it useful. No one is debating whether or not the observation observed were real or not. It's just more about whether or not they were beneficial. The last one, impact of short existence of Asperger's syndrome on public perception. What was the impact? We've got the autism, increased understanding of autism, reduced stigma. Let's have a look at this. Is there a real answer for this? Public fascination of autism. Not true. More people got more interested because of it. Asperger's arguably has been a really good thing for autism overall. Increased understanding of ASD. No, if anything, it made it more confusing for a lot of people. Reduced stigma associated with autism. Part of the reason Asperger's was gotten rid of was because it actually increased stigma because people started to think we were either Rayman or we were like socially mute. We got boosted public fascination. For good or bad, Asperger's fascinated people. People were interested by it and people wanted to learn more. All right, let's see how you all did. Of course it is. We've got some in-house corruption by the looks of it. Let's see. Stomp Girl 87, aka the one and only April. A strong second. MZ, a very respectable third. The key takeaways from today is history, man. It's complicated. Um, Asperger's syndrome classification has shifted since 1944. What we used to know it as to what we know it as now reflects the ongoing diagnostic debates. And I am certain we are not finished with ASD. I am certain that it will change again. This doesn't mean that we were wrong. It means that our understanding has shifted and we have a new perspective. 
It just means that it also takes quite a lot of time to bring people along for the journey. We know that there is still a very strong debate over it. It's very contentious. People get really wild up around it. The distinct and shared traits with ASD provoke continuous discussions. There's some things that are quite similar with Asperger's to autism, but equally, they are very distinct and people don't really see them as the same. In the DSM-5, there was a merging of Asperger's into ASD. Officially, you are probably very likely never to be diagnosed with Asperger's again. Maybe someone slips through the net, but I don't think so. This uh, also underscores classification issues, because maybe some people still find that diagnosis more useful. The future, clarity in the autism spectrum categorization remains crucial for better support. The better the clarification system is, the easier it is to give support. Do we think a broader diagnosis means you are more likely to get support because it doesn't shut down a conversation before it has begun? Or do we believe an absolute pinpoint exact diagnosis, which exactly mirrors your, um, your experience, is more beneficial? But that is part of the debate that we're trying to figure out. All right, we're at the end, everyone. Well done. How many tongue twisters today? And I swear I pronounce Asperger's seven different ways. But here is some lovely referencing if you uh, want to get into the books and read a little bit further. The first one is the O Hans Asperger's edition. I recommend reading the British, the English translation if you read English. Make a little bit more sense, but it really has changed a lot over time. If any of you do have Asperger's or autism or any name, or any recognition, you can gain support in the UK, okay? You do not have to have an official diagnosis. Whatever you were diagnosed with, whatever you resonate with, you are still absolutely eligible for support. Okay, Emma says, people have often told me my sister that my nephew has Asperger's and I have to tell them that it's not a thing anymore. It's one of those things that if people personally resonate with it, fair enough. If someone says, I think they may have, I think what they're trying to say is they're trying to narrow it down a bit more, or maybe they want to portray a certain view of autism to others. If you have Asperger's syndrome, it could be conceived as a better version of autism than what we would have considered classic autism, which is one of the reasons we got rid of it, actually, because it exacerbated stigma. I don't think people do it intentionally, though. Our next webinar is maths learning disability, not just dyscalculia, because dyscalculia is one type of maths learning disability. We are going to be looking at the wider spectrum of mass learning disabilities. We have loads of webinars that you can subscribe to and see all the previous ones. This one has been recorded today and will be uploaded shortly. We have an autism group, which you are welcome to attend on Facebook. Here are our contact details if you want to get in contact. Oh, thank you everyone for the lovely comments. Always really appreciate reading them. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. And have a lovely rest of your Thursdays. Remember, it's Neurodiversity Celebration Week. So do celebrate. Talk about it to people. Spread the awareness. All right, everyone. Have a great day and uh, catch you soon. Bye.